was almost like slow motion, like when they do, you know, let's say you watch the, the sun come up and the changes that happen, that's what it felt like throughout the day. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 165, and thank you for dropping on in. Today's episode, we hear from Mr. Andrew Freund, a longtime sumo practitioner. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times every week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you just checking us out for the first time. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and that's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our Top 10 Tips for Martial Artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at headquarters, upcoming show guests, and even discounts on some of our products. You know, we're always asking for guest suggestions, but we've recently been hearing some folks say they don't know anyone famous or I'm not nearly on their level. The show is not about fame. It's not about rank. It's about hearing the stories of good people who happen to be martial artists. Please don't hesitate to make a suggestion for the show. If it's not a good fit, don't worry. We won't air it. It hit me one day that there's a martial art we never talk about in traditional circles. It's rarely in media, and yet it seems like the traditions are older than our interpretations of most traditional martial arts, at least the ones we consider traditional. So it was that I went looking for someone who could talk on the show about sumo. When you research sumo in the United States, you inevitably find information about today's guest. As a sumo practitioner, event promoter, talent agent, and so much more, Mr. Andrew Freund has dedicated his life to the art of sumo. It was very clear after some research that this was the man to have on the show, and I'm so pleased he accepted the invitation. Let's welcome him. Mr. Freund, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, thanks very much, Jeremy. Great to be on here. Oh, it's great to have you. I appreciate it. You are going to be our first person on here to talk about sumo. And here we are more than 150 episodes later, and you know we're, we're going to put you on the spot a little bit to, to kind of represent sumo being the first person that's come on as a, a sumo martial artist. But before we do that, before we get into all the stuff that you've got going on, and it's quite the list, we need some context for who you are. So why don't you tell us how you got started in martial arts? Oh, well, thanks. So uh, first of all, I should mention there's probably, uh, there's not probably, there's definitely many great uh, sumo wrestlers uh, especially guys with pro sumo experience in Japan who have achieved uh, much more than I have. But um, I do have a little bit of, of knowledge of it, and so I appreciate you giving me a chance to talk. Um, so, yeah, in terms of martial arts, I, uh, I grew up playing sports. I played uh, <clears throat> soccer for many years um, growing up on the East Coast. And um, I played a lot of basketball, uh, and I still do, uh, as a hobby as well. I ran cross-country and track, so I was kind of active in a lot of uh, running sports, um, minimal martial arts background when I was young. Actually, when I was about nine or ten, my dad brought me and one of my brothers. I'm, I'm the oldest of five. It's me and then a couple of brothers and a couple of sisters. But he brought us to do kendo. I have no idea why, but I'm glad that he did. So out of the blue, I'm a kid wearing the the whole kendo outfit. And um, I only did that for a year or two, but it, it was really impressive uh, to learn about kind of this other tradition. Um, and back in those days, actually, it's not that long ago, but, you know, there was still a process of getting martial arts more well-known in this country. So that was my, my first experience. When I, was, um, when I was in college, I went to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I learned a little bit um, of Tai Chi. And I did that for a couple of years there with a club uh, in Santa Barbara at UCSB. And uh, when I went to Japan after finishing college, I also studied some Aikido there. So I had a very nominal background in martial arts, um, I, you know, through my early 20s. Uh, I did end up going to Japan right after college. And long story short, in college, um, I, I finished, uh, I graduated when I was 19, um, for whatever bizarre reason, I only took uh, about a year and a half, and I did some crazy academic feats at the time. But I ended up um, teaching in Japan when I was only 19 years old, and I was, you know, wearing a suit and tie and going to 
you know, places like the headquarters of Nissan and uh, uh, quite a few other large companies. But I was kind of out of my element because even though I was 19, I think emotionally I was about, you know, 10 years old. So I was kind of nervous and shy and, and um, very, very intrigued by Japanese culture, very interested in history and, and martial arts and the spirituality in Japan. But in terms of being in the modern society and riding on, on trains all day and, and being surrounded by crowds of Japanese people, I was still kind of um, uncomfortable. I was still a kid. Uh, back, uh, back at that time, that was the first of a couple times that I worked in Japan, I didn't really know anything about sumo, per se, and I pretty much uh, stayed at home and kind of lived a quiet life uh, while I was there. Before I came back to the States, I, um, I thought, hey, I have to explore J Japan a little. And I did you know, various activities, visited some famous places, and I got a copy of the Tokyo Journal, which was kind of the major English magazine for people living in Japan at the time. And in, in the Tokyo Journal, I was looking through the events, and it said, sumo tournament. And I wasn't really familiar with, with how those tournaments operated. And it listed a 15-day span when the tournament was taking place in Ryogoku, which is uh, kind of the eastern side of Tokyo. And I was living in uh, Ichikawa, which is only a few train stations away. So I thought, okay. I'm going to go check it out. So I, I chose a day when I was free. I wasn't teaching. And uh, it said the time was, I believe, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And without really thinking, I, uh, I showed up there at about 9.30. And anybody with common sense, which I didn't have much of at the time, uh, would have understood or would have researched. We didn't really have the Internet back then, but uh, still, uh, you know, it, it would have made sense to... to check when the main event is. So essentially, I showed up at 9.30. I bought the, the cheap tickets way, way, way up in the, in the nosebleed section of the stadium. And there were about, you know, three people in the, in the whole stadium. It seats about 15,000 people in the Kokogi Kong. So I was sitting way up at the top. There were, you know, a handful of other people down by the ring. And I basically sat there until about 4 o'clock when other fans started to show up. So that was my first exposure uh, to, to pro sumo in Japan. Um, so I basically sat there until 6 o'clock. I sat there for about 8 or 9 hours watching match after match and not quite knowing what I was seeing. Um, and, I, you know, I was by myself. I, I didn't go with, with any friends at the time. So uh, I do remember from that experience, uh, when I watched the matches, I felt the sensation of, ooh, I, you know, I was kind of moving my body along with the match as if I was in the match. Um, so it kind of, kind of got me excited to be like, okay, I'm going to be dodging, I'm going to be pushing, I'm going to be doing this. So I, I did feel a lot of interest or intensity in the, the dynamic nature of the sport. Um, and you know, after that time, there were a couple other times that I did see pro sumo in Japan. Um, but I didn't think much of it at the time. And then a few years later in Los Angeles, this is about 20 years ago in the, in the mid-90s, there was a sumo demonstration at a Japan Expo here. And uh, I went with a friend to this Japan Expo. And there were kind of uh, the number of cultural events. There were all kinds of Japanese dance and arts and martial arts were part of that. And so we watched the, the sumo demonstration. And at the end, uh, some of the, the uh, announcers said, anyone want to come up and try it? And I thought, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. So I I told my friend he was a rather large person. I said, "Hey, go ahead and go ahead and go up there and try it." And and he adamantly refused. And I said, "Come on, you know you can do it." And he kept refusing again and again. Finally, after you know several times, he said, "All right, I'll do it if you do it." And I said, "Sure." And at the time, I was about 142 pounds. I've since you know, over 20 years now. I've since bulked up to about 160. Uh, but I was 142 pounds and. Uh, I went up there, and I think we were the only two volunteers. So we did a bunch of matches. It was a lot of fun. And long story short, within a short period of weeks, I had started a sumo club at UCLA, which is where I was, one of the places I was teaching at at the time. 
So that's really the genesis of my participation in sumo uh, here in, in Los Angeles and in the United States. Wow. So I kind of want to go back to something that you said, because maybe you don't realize it, or, or, or maybe you're just kind of glossing over it. But you you went to a sport that you didn't really understand, and you sat there for nine hours, eight, eight and a half hours. And, and really, the majority of those hours were, you know, there wasn't a whole lot going on, so little going on that people weren't there. Mm-hmm. And you sat there in bleachers. Now, I can think of things that I will go and sit for seven or eight hours to watch. And it's a really small list. And there certainly can't be too much. I, I'm guessing there isn't too much that I or most other people would sit and watch, not really understanding, not be, going in, being passionate about, that they would wait that long. So there, there must have been something in there that held your interest pretty early on. Yeah, that, it's hard for, for me to say exactly, but um, it it is interesting. Um, I didn't really think much about it at the time. I just thought, okay, this is the event, the, this is the schedule. And it took me a little while before I realized, well, I'm going to keep seeing the same thing uh, every few minutes, match after match. And, and the interesting thing is there's a ritual between each match, and when you get to the higher-ranked guys, it's about four minutes or so between each match. The lower-ranked guys, they do the ritual quickly or an abbreviated form and it's only a minute or two but yeah absolutely um i I suppose i could have gotten up and 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 left and come back etc but um i I guess it was intriguing to see the the ritual to see the progression throughout the day because part of what's uh fantastic about sumo aside from the sporting side of it is that it's not just like a regular sport or even most martial arts it's a huge part of Japanese culture, and actually it's almost a vehicle to preserve traditional Japanese culture, whether people like some of those aspects or not, um, there is a huge amount of, of ritual and repetition uh, that goes on in, in pro sumo. And, you know, for example, in the early part of the day, they do a, a short ritual. The referees who are the lower-ranked referees wear very simple costumes, And as the day goes on, the rituals become more elaborate, there's more steps, there's more fanfare, and the referees progressively have brighter and more elaborate uh, decorative, uh, you know, kimono that they wear. So it was almost like slow motion, like when they do, you know, let's say you watch the the sun come up uh, and the changes that happen, that's what it felt like throughout the day. As I watched hour after hour, there would be subtle additions uh, to the stadium, you know, the increase in fans, etc. So I think that was a fascinating aspect outside of the sport itself. It was a reflection of traditional Japanese culture. Hmm. And clearly at that point, you, you recognized that you were interested in Japanese culture. It's why you, you moved there. You, know, you wanted to, I think your words were you wanted to explore Japan more. Yes. Cool. Yeah, it's very true. It's funny when I, when I first watched sumo back then, um, that was, gosh, that was back in 1991, I want to say, yeah. When I first uh, watched Sumo then, um, I had no idea that eventually I'd be, you know, dealing with that world full-time around the clock, seven days a week, year after year, decade after decade. Um, but, you know, something from, from that moment, I guess, triggered this impulse and, uh, over time, it's it's developed into what it is today. So uh, I'm really grateful that I had the chance to go to Japan when I was young, even though I had a hard time when I was there back then, uh, because I learned a lot and it kind of opened the door to a new world for me. Um, and so it's you know it's led me in the direction I am today. I never never could have imagined back then that uh, that my life would be like it is now. But a lot of that is thanks to uh, to the role that, that sumo has played. And I think so many of us that are employed in martial arts related roles, whether it's owning a school or running an organization or hosting a podcast, you know, none of us would go back to our genesis in martial arts and say, hey, this is where I'm going to end up. It's just, it's such a crazy ride for, I don't even think for, for some of us, I think for the vast majority of us as we stay in martial arts. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been an amazing ride. There's been some hard, very hard points and uh, 
some very phenomenal points too. But yeah, you're you're right absolutely about that. Cool. So I think we just learned a whole bunch about who you are and and maybe not all of why you're so passionate about sumo, but we're getting some bits and I know that we're going to have more bits come through as we start to build more of a picture about who you are as a person and as a martial artist. But here on the show, it's all about stories. You told some great stories back there, you know, weaving them in and out. I'll let you go completely off the rails, go to whatever time period you want now. Tell us your best martial arts story. Yeah, but so best martial arts story. Um, I don't know if I could name just one, but I guess one kind of dramatic scene comes to mind um, just for the sheer shock value of it. And it's related to the nature of sumo, and that is, unlike a lot of other martial arts, uh, there aren't weight classes in traditional sumo in Japan. Now, obviously, there are some MMA fights where they show a, a smaller person facing a, a much larger person, but typically there are weight classes. And actually, in sumo, on an amateur level around the world, on an international amateur level, there have been weight classes implemented. Uh, and the purpose there is to uh, hopefully make sumo an Olympic sport. And by having both gender classes for men and women and weight classes, uh, the, the dream is that sumo will become an Olympic sport in the future. But uh, putting that aside, traditionally in Japan, there have been no weight classes. And even in amateur sumo, there are lightweight, heavy, I'm sorry, lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight. But there's also open weight where they have people of all sizes fight each other. So I remember back in... I think it was 2010, give or take a year. I think it's 2010, maybe 11. I have to go back and look. But um, I was competing in the national championship, and uh, I did okay in the lightweight. But at the end, there was an open weight competition, and my first match was against a guy who has been recognized by Guinness World Records as the heaviest uh, athlete in history, I believe, <laughs> and said. So, yeah, sadly, he uh, he passed away uh, a little over. Let's see, would have been um, would have been a little over a year ago. He passed away at the end of uh, 2015. But he's an American guy named Manny Arboro or Emmanuel Arboro. And at his prime, he was I don't know if I should say prime, but at his at his peak, he was uh, six foot eight, or some people said six foot nine, and. Um, close to 800 pounds. I think he was listed as 770 or 780. Anyway, when I had a match against him, he was well over 700 pounds, I'm sure. And uh, at that time, I was probably about, some, probably like I am now, about 155, 160 pounds. And uh, the result is that I lost the match, but it was quite a dramatic match because it lasted about 30 seconds with me trying to use speed and staying low and maintaining my balance as his, uh, you know, his you know, slapping attacks were coming at me. And I kind of dodged him around the ring, going left, going right several times and tried to get in behind him. Finally, after about 30 seconds, uh, he got one big shove and I went out. But that was, in a way, one of the more visually dramatic experiences that I had uh, in sumo competition. Wow. You know, we see those sorts of images in movies. I mean, that that's that's about as cliche as you get, I think, for a martial arts exchange, right? You know, the the, the small guy up against the, the huge guy, the David and Goliath paradigm. I, I, you know, we see it all through literature and, and movies, and I think it's something that as martial artists, a lot of us really resonate with. But, you know, this is no karate kid story, you know, fairy tale. That's the word I was looking for. You know, the I, I can only imagine what the, the slap of, of someone who weighs 700 pounds would feel like. <laughs> yeah. No, it was fine. It was it's all in good fun and you know, he and I were, were friends and um yeah, there were there were no serious injuries, but it was for the for the audience there it was obviously extremely exciting. And um that I just thought about that incident just now that really that stands out as one of the kind of the coolest little you know, events that I participated in. Um you know, another well, I'll mention one other one other incident. This is not something where I participated in, but you know, producing the U.S. Sumo Open, uh, which is the biggest tournament we have in, in this country, and actually some people call it the largest annual sumo competition on the planet outside of Japan, and it's been 
quite a labor of love now. This year we'll have the the 17th annual U.S. Sumo Open. The the first one was in 2001, and um, the 17th will be June 17th of 2017 this year. But there's been probably close to let's see, we've got to have probably close to 15, let's see, maybe 1,500 matches or so over the years. And there's been some incredible matches, but I think one that stands out, and, and this is an event where I'm producing and announcing, so I'm not competing, but one match that stands out and kind of uh, changed things in terms of how sumo is viewed in this country is in 2013, uh, there's a guy named Biamba, Biamba Javulamba, are originally from Mongolia. And he uh, has won, I think his record is like, 97 wins and four losses during 11 years of competing in the U.S. Sumo Open. Uh, he's four-time world champion. He spent years uh, when he was a teenager in Japanese pro sumo. He's just the most dominant competitor internationally for many years. And he's been here with us in Los Angeles for most of the last 11 years or so. And uh, he's won countless dramatic matches against many champions from many different countries, He's won the gold medal 10 out of 11 years. Uh, he got the silver medal one year out of those 11 when he had a few issues he was dealing with. But in 2013, one of his matches was against a 450-pound opponent, an American guy who's been the five-time U.S. champion. And Biamba, who's about 370 pounds, uh, lifted the 450-pounder up in the air so that the, the 450-pound guy was about six feet in the air with his body parallel, horizontal, to the to the floor to the mat and he literally lifted the guy in one motion and slammed him down and uh, i think for many people who didn't know about sumo that was their first exposure in this country because we got many millions of hits on youtube uh many many tv shows featured that and espn selected that as the uh one of the top 10 videos of the month so something like that i would say that's almost like a game-changing moment in terms of sumo's relevance and in terms of the recognition of the athleticism of sumo in this country, because people traditionally had stereotypes that sumo wrestlers are just waddling around and they're, they're very uh, fat and they don't have a lot of agility. But a guy like Biamba is really an ambassador for the sport. Uh, he really demonstrates the complete package of speed and strength, flexibility, technique, every kind of athleticism. And if I had to pinpoint one very brief clip, if people want to get an idea of what that athleticism is all about, you can basically go online and type in Sumo Slam. So Sumo S-L-A-M, Sumo Slam. And that's kind of the one video clip, I think, that, that changed things a lot in terms of people's perception. Well, wow. and I'm glad that you spoke to that because that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask directly for my benefit and for the benefit of everyone listening that... I think culturally in America, we have this idea that sumo wrestlers just spend their days eating and, and really their size is, is fat and any strength they have is just from their sheer mass. But mm -hmm. here, you know, to be able to pick up your body weight, you know, anywhere approaching your, your head is a rather uh, impressive accomplishment. Picking up something, someone that weighs more than you to your head level is is incredibly rare. So mm. I'm going to make sure that we find that video and that we link it over in the show notes. For anyone that might be new to the show, that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you'll be able to see that in the rest of the show notes about what we're talking about today. So. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I could tell you hundreds of clips, but if we want to encapsulate everything in a nutshell, that that 30-second clip is is probably like the attention getter that will get people involved in sumo more and more. Cool. That's really impressive. And I'm looking forward to, to checking that out myself. Now, obviously, sumo is a huge part of your life. I mean, between your your professional and your, your training sides of your life. But what else is there to you? I mean, do you have any other hobbies? Do you have time for any other hobbies? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm actually uh, a pretty private person. So I spend a lot of time... Uh, on my own, and and I uh, have a few close friends, but I spend a lot of time reading and studying and uh, doing my own creative projects. So really, I don't really uh, share much of my private life um, with the outside world. 
when people see me producing an event or announcing or competing, uh, you know, I put on a whole different persona. So, you know, when I produce the U.S. Sumo Open, I have to deal with hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, literally thousands of phone calls in the weeks and months leading up to it. And, you know, I'm there as the announcer, the producer, the scorekeeper, pretty much every possible role, you know, building, helping to build a stage and breaking it down and, and everything. So I kind of, in the face of, of that event, but in my my own time, I, I, I do a lot of my own studies, a lot of my own reading and uh, maintain some some exercise, including sumo. But, you know, like I said, I like to play basketball sometimes, take a hike um, and also dabble a little bit in, in other martial arts as well. And these are things that have developed over time. Like I said, when I first got interested in sumo, there was no plan. I thought maybe I'd make a little club and, and do it as a hobby. Um, but it's kind of grown over time. And looking back to 20 or 25 years ago, I might have done things uh, differently in retrospect, but um, things have just kind of uh, developed this way. So in terms of my free time, yeah, there's, there's nothing dramatic I could tell you about. I'm not you know, driving race cars or, or parachuting out of airplanes or anything like that, but I, I do like to spend a lot of kind of quiet time to balance out the, the intensity of, of working on major productions and, and events. That is something that I can understand and certainly relate to. <laughs> sure. <laughs> cool. Life can be tough. We all know that we all have challenges, and I think it's one of the things that can bring us together when we're willing to talk about them. Martial yeah, arts can help us overcome a lot of stuff that people that don't train, you know, maybe don't have quite the same tool set to work with. I'd like you to think about a time in your life that maybe something just wasn't right, something was challenging, and how your martial arts training helped you move through it. Sure. I, I think I can uh, relate to uh, to that experience in, in many, many situations. But perhaps um, a good example would be the genesis of actually producing the U.S. Sumo Open, uh, because that involves kind of all aspects uh, of, of what I do. Um, back in 2001, when I was producing the first U S sumo open, I was involved in you know training in sumo and coaching and competing. Uh, we had at least three days a week. We would practice at, at UCLA. Um, you know, I was individually contacting each of the athletes, letting them know the training schedule. Uh, it, it was very complicated at the time, actually, to get people in there. And back at the beginning of 2001, um, I had this idea. I thought, hey, let's let's put on a tournament. And I thought this would be a few hours of my time, you know, a few hundred dollars to make it happen. Little did I know what I was getting into. And I think if someone knew in advance the, the challenges that would have been involved, they probably would not have proceeded with the plan. Uh, it was kind of foolhardy what I was doing with the limited experience and resources that I had. But um, essentially, I was teaching multiple jobs. Each job was nearly full time, so I was I was teaching at different uh, colleges from, uh, you know, basically nine in the morning until oftentimes with with tutoring and other gigs until nine at night, and with, with almost no break, literally half hour for for a meal, and that was about it. And I was doing that four or five days a week, plus uh, about half of that much on Saturdays. And I thought, okay, I'm going to produce this tournament. Well, within, you know, four or five months before the tournament, I was essentially sleeping two to maybe two and a half, three hours a night, every night, seven days a week, because I, was get, I would get home and I'd work all evening until about four or five in the morning with the, uh, the production in terms of emailing. We invited a team from Japan. We invited Konishiki, who is the heaviest Japanese, pro, I'm sorry, the heaviest uh, sumo wrestler and Japanese professional sumo ever. He's Hawaiian born, but he had retired and he was a, you know, a great guest to have at that event. But I had never brought in guys from overseas. I'd never produced an event of that scale. Um, it, it's, it's embarrassing to say this uh, now, but the marketing plan was basically uh, having a friend of mine print some flyers and I would go around every night, late at night, finding restaurants or, or stores that were still open and saying, hey, can you post this, <laughs> post this up on your wall? You know, we didn't really have much internet marketing back then. 
at least um, in my world. And so it was completely grassroots what I was doing. And uh, it was tremendously taxing because, again, I was sleeping maybe 15 or maximum 20 hours a week. And um, there were times when I, I, don't, I didn't know if I could even maintain that uh, for even another day. But somehow I just had this, this motivation. I don't know why. I don't know what kind of made me do that. I think it was probably similar to when I was at, at UCSB. And for some reason, I started doing these enormous feats of, of taking quadruple the normal load. I, I'll go into that another time. That's, a, that's a, long, a long story. But somehow I did these marathon uh, prep sessions for the U.S. Zoom Open. We, we made it happen. And in the process, I had to use every penny I had. I took out big loans. I got a lien on my car. And even after the event, I lost a tremendous amount of money. So anybody with any common sense or business sense, uh, six months in advance, if they saw what was coming, they would have said, you're, you're an idiot. This is foolhardy. Pull out now. Uh, but I didn't really go to anybody for advice at the time. And so I did the, the crazy thing, and I produced the event. And afterwards, I, I virtually literally collapsed. I, I could barely get up for, for weeks. And my face was like frozen in a, in a zombie-like uh, condition. I could barely function. It took me a few months to really get over that. I mean, I was literally that, you know, that's when I, I started to look into, um, you know, more things like acupuncture or, or you know, Chinese herbs that, that took months and months, but things like that helped me recover because I was depleted beyond belief. So I think in doing this entire process, I was also training every week. I was, I was running the practices. Um, so physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, every possible challenge was coming up, and I was I was basically doing the work of 10 or 15 people uh, to produce that tournament. And after the tournament, I thought, I'm never going to do this again. You know, I'm pretty much done with sumo. It was fun to do it as a hobby, but I'm, I'm never going to do an event again. Uh, but somehow that, that seed to produce the next U.S. Sumo Open developed in me, and, and a year later, we, <laughs> we had the second U.S. Sumo Open, and... and it was also kind of a disaster financially, and it took a huge, uh, a huge amount of my time. But somehow I did a third U.S. Sumo Open, a fourth, et cetera, and it really uh, was hard every year, and it, it slowly got a little better. But it took about 10 or 12 years. I think it was probably actually maybe 12 years before the event even broke even financially. Um, and, and all the money that was going into it was money that I was making in my other jobs. And so it, it's an extremely foolhardy proposition from the, from a business perspective. People would probably look at what I did and say, "You are you're insane. You don't have any common sense." Um, so in retrospect, I don't know if I would have made the same choices, but in a certain sense, I'm glad that I did because just some current kind of pushed me in that direction. And once I kind of got the ball rolling, it snowballed uh, since then. <clears throat> I'm going to edit that. I needed to cough. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I probably need to, too. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so here we heard, you know, your kind of vague appeal for, not appeal, uh, uh, passion towards sumo early on, before you even really knew what was going on. And I'm I'm seeing something really similar in putting on this event. Uh, longtime listeners, people that know me personally know that Whistlekick put on an event just under a year ago was April of 2016. So I can relate, I, you know, hearing what you were talking about, the sleep deprivation, uh, the the financial burden, the time burden, just all of those things. I, I, I get it. But there must have been something going on there, whether you, you it was something conscious or not, to go 10, 12 years without making money. You know, a lot of people will start a business and say, you know what? Yeah, I didn't expect to make money the first year, the second year, third year, maybe the first five years. But there, there's something going on here. Either you're really good at playing the long game or are you that passionate about sumo that you're willing to invest all of who you are into spreading it? Yeah, that, those are very good questions. And I, I still have to kind of ask myself, what was going on to find the answer. And I think the first point is that I never, ever thought about these things from a business perspective. And I really wasn't playing the long game either because I was only focused 
on the next event. I was only focused on what we were doing at that moment. So it wasn't like I had a plan that this is how it will develop in three years or five years or, you know, 10 or 20 years. I just wanted to do the best possible event or best possible, you know, TV production, whatever we were working on at the time. And that was how I approached it each of those years, um, especially at the beginning. I, I just thought I want to make this the most dramatic event, the most you know, complete event. I want to improve the event. I want to make the fans happy. I want to give the athletes a great experience. I want to bring in more foreign teams. I want the, uh, the media to cover this. So my only goal was to try to do the best possible event for the fans, the media, the athletes, the officials, and everybody involved. And I didn't really think about the, the business side. And gradually, uh, the, the business partner of mine who gradually got more and more involved, uh, she helped us focus on let's at least stay afloat. Let's at least try to break even. And I guess the, the fortunate side of that is we brought in guys like Biamba, who I mentioned, um, and more recently, a few years ago, a guy called Yama, former Yama Motoyama, who is the heaviest Japanese human being in recorded history. And so talking about the, the business model, which, again, we didn't have a business model. It was just uh, spontaneously developed as you know, one new aspect uh, after another came up. So having guys like Biamba and Yama, who are really, I would say, unique in this country, and actually many would say they're unique in the world outside of Japan. So the, the, in terms of their multi-time world champion titles, in terms of their years of experience in pro sumo, in terms of their impressive size and, and pedigree and sumo ability and their image, they're virtually unique. So I guess we're fortunate somehow or another we had guys like these, and because of their presence, it enabled us to, um, to make up for what we were losing on tournaments. And what I mean is these guys started getting booked week after week on, on TV shows and commercials and films and things like that. So I had never had an aspiration or I never dreamed about working in the entertainment business whatsoever, but it was like that spark that created that first sumo club kind of built up more and more. And once we brought over some of these authentic guys who had pro sumo experience and they had the image, it, um, it turned into a great opportunity for them because uh, they are, are now, and you know, even from the beginning, highly sought after because there are not many other guys who even look like them, not to mention uh, the level of athletic ability they have. So you know, little by little over time, since about 20 years ago, uh, we've become the managers, uh, de facto agents, uh, you know, I've become the personal manager, interpreter, publicist, uh, whatever, whatever other requirements they may have for these world champion athletes. Mm, you're still wearing a lot of hats all these years later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. There. I'm barely telling you a few of them, but I guess the, uh, you know, the point there is that, um, you know, despite all the challenges with the, with the tournaments, in other words, putting in, uh, I don't know, putting in maybe a couple thousand hours to produce one event and losing tens of thousands of dollars on it. You know, on the other hand, I put in a very minimal amount of time and it would be very profitable to be on a, a TV project or a commercial, very profitable for those guys. And of course, we would get a small amount of that and, and that basically would cover the cost um, of all the expenses that we were losing money on for the tournament. So there, there was kind of a balance there. Now it's, it's, you know, it's developed to a point where it's not, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking out huge loans every month to, to repay uh, expenses from tournaments. So thank God it's now a little bit more stable. Sure. And I think the part that I, I want to underscore there is one, you know, kind of the unpredictability, the fact that you just kind of kept grinding on it and something opened up. Not only did the thing that you were grinding on primarily work you know eventually mm -hmm. it worked you made it happen but mm -hmm. then these other opportunities came up and i think that that's something that i wish more people would realize whether it's martial arts or not martial arts that when you're mm -hmm. dedicated to something eventually it will work yeah that's a really really a key point and when i reflect back on it if someone had done something only for business they might get great results but there would probably be something lacking in terms of like the integrity, the authenticity, the passion, etc. 
and I don't want to be presumptuous, but um, when I think back about all these years, you know, like I mentioned, when producing the U.S. Sumo Open or other tournaments or events, the goal for me was always just to make the best possible event I could without regard to the, the expenses, without regard to money, without regard to my own kind of time challenges. And the same thing goes for these talent, guys like Biamba and Yama and many others. The goal was simply to give them the best exposure that we could, no pun intended when they're wearing the sumo belt, but yeah, give them exposure. Um, but seriously, we, you know, basically develop their careers. And I always went into these projects with the intent of, uh, of service, really, to, to help them fulfill their potential since they had left Japan and they had left pro sumo, but to fulfill their potential uh, here in a different world. And I'd like to think that, um, you know, I and, and my associates have been at least a small part of that, of that movement. And I think, like you said, that applies to anybody in any situation. If someone's going into something only for, for money or only for fame or only for some quick result, it may not really withstand the test of time. But if you go into something with a passion for it, to develop yourself, to learn something very deeply, and also to provide a service to others, to really help other people fulfill their potential, um, that, that effort will likely yield uh, very strong and, and long-term results. I completely agree. Now, we haven't heard a lot about the people, the martial arts people in your life. We've, we've heard about some of the athletes that you've promoted at these events. But if I was to ask you who the most influential person has been in your martial arts career, who would that be? Well, I don't know if I could name one person who's been influential in, in my martial arts training and uh, other aspects. But uh, let me talk a little bit about that process and the process that I went through, and I'll mention some of the people involved is probably a little different from most martial artists that you cover because most of the guys that become prominent martial artists, they go in from a, an early age with the goal of, of mastery, with the goal of perhaps competing, uh, with the goal of a certain level of attainment. And I started sumo completely as a hobby, something to do in my free time, something that was fun. I like to go into the the dojo or whichever place we were renting space at. And, um, you know, I might be at that time, 140 something, 150 pounds. And we have guys who are 300 plus and many times more than that. And I just went in and I thought this is going to be fun to try to challenge myself to find a way to take down someone who's much bigger. And so I didn't have any particular goal early on, uh, to achieve a certain level of, uh, of competition success. And um, it, it was really more of a hobby at first, but little by little over time, I started picking up tidbits from a lot of these people I mentioned about what sumo and really what martial arts in general are all about. And so I have to confess, I mean, that in these, these 20 years, it's only been in the last few years, to be honest, that I feel like I've really gotten a, a deeper insight or more clarity um, on many points about sumo and also many points about how martial arts uh, work in general. And to, to clarify that, at first, when I started a sumo club, I didn't have any formal training. I had done a few other martial arts, as mentioned, but we had a guy back then from Bulgaria. I helped him uh, as well as Biamba and Yama and others kind of secure their, their legal status here and be able to work and promote the sport. And the guy from Bulgaria looked like a bodybuilder, but he had won multiple times the World Sumo Championships in the lightweight division. And so he was kind of the first influence. His name is uh, Svetoslav Binev, and nicknamed Svet. So he kind of was the genesis of developing our sumo club. However, he had no formal training in sumo in Japan, so he was using wrestling techniques. And so my first years in sumo practice involved using... Uh, training techniques I had learned online or from watching uh, Japanese TV, coupled with the, the wrestling fundamentals from Svet. And for many years, I was just trying to use strength and speed and um, very, uh, how can I put it, not-so-subtle techniques. 
Um, and then when Biamba came here about 11 years ago, and he started training with us regularly, I and everybody else learned a lot more about the, the subtleties of sumo and the really core uh, types of, of training um, that help not only improve your uh, your success in the ring, but also help to build up, you know, strength and prevent injuries and things like that. And I gradually started to learn from Biamba, and then in more recent years, guys like Yama, as well as a Japanese university champion named Takeshi, have been really influential because they each bring their own brand of of sumo knowledge. Um, this guy Takeshi, for example, he's barely 200 pounds, but he was a, a university champion in Japan. And without him explicitly stating things, so he really doesn't uh, talk about what he's doing, just by watching and feeling and, and, and kind of by osmosis, I've learned a lot from him just in the last year or so since he's been here uh, in terms of how someone smaller can sense the other oppo- opponent's uh, movements and, um, you know, overcome that, that size a disadvantage. So there's not really one person per se, but I'd say a combination of all these very successful sumo wrestlers, um, along with an appreciation of, of certain um, tips from other martial arts, um, it, it's, it's an ongoing process. I'll, I'll tell you, I wish that 20 years ago or even 30 years ago, I had the, the kind of teachers that I, I have today around me. And, the interesting thing is the dynamic with with us, and this is kind of unusual in the way we practice here, is not like a traditional pro sumo heya or team, and it's not even like a traditional martial arts dojo where there's the the sensei or the sifu or the the master. Um, for better or for worse, just the way we are in Los Angeles when we practice, it's basically we're all friends. And of course, we listen to and show respect for the people who have more experience, but it's somewhat informal at this stage. So in other words, I go in and and I learn a few things and I teach others a few things. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing process in terms of what we're developing because it's it's been very rare for guys with real sumo knowledge to come to the United States and share that. And it's it's very hard for Americans in general to to understand and learn that. And there's very, very few people at this point who have a real passion to learn it seriously. There's a lot of people who want to try it once or twice, but the, uh, the way of teaching people, the way of training is, is definitely a challenge, and that's something we're going to have to develop uh, more in depth in the years to come. Yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff for sure. Now, if you had someone that you could have trained with, you know, you talked about 20, 30 years ago, and obviously 20, 30 years ago, there were some different people. Yes. If you could go to any point in time, train with any martial artist, alive or dead, who would that be? <laughs> I, I can't say one name. I really can't say one name of one person that I want to train with. But um, aside from sumo, even, I think if I had a, a chance, I'd want to learn from some of the great, um, I mean, this is a different sport, but let's say some of the great uh, Kung Fu or Tai Chi masters, um, because the principle, and this is something I've only learned very, very recently, not, not 20 years ago, not 10 years ago, just in recent years. But the principle is that in a lot of those traditional, very traditional kind of origin martial, martial arts, the concept is that, um, regardless of the size, if someone has uh, more sensitivity, if someone has, uh, you know, reflexes and training, they can overcome a size disadvantage. They can overcome a strength disadvantage. They can overcome any number of handicaps uh, with a much more subtle, uh, you know, sensitivity with, with that kind of energy. And sumo is seemingly to most observers, completely the opposite where it's all about brute strength and speed and, and power and in your face. But, you know, counterintuitive to that, there's a huge amount of, of, um, kind of the inside, there's a huge amount of subtlety in sumo that you may not see at first, but if you observe it for years and you watch match after match, you can see that many of the really successful guys in sumo are not using sheer strength and speed. Uh, They're using uh, something uh, else or something in addition to defeat opponents who seemingly 
are stronger or larger than they are. So I can't really state one particular person that I wish uh, I could have trained with, but I think I would have gone back to kind of very fundamental principles in martial arts. And um, like I said, let's say, you know, very traditional Tai Chi or Kung Fu uh, have those elements uh, in them. And I've never studied those martial arts very much. I've taken a little bit of, of those uh, traditional Chinese martial arts, but I see a lot of similar concepts in there that are very applicable to any martial art, including sumo. We've heard a lot about who you are today, and we've really kind of dug deep, but the next few questions are a, a little lighter. Mm -hmm. I think they, they can be just as insightful, and of course, they're, they're fun, too. Let's talk about movies. Are you at all a <laughs> fan of martial arts movies? Yeah, I, I do like martial arts movies quite a bit, and in the last few years, I've been watching a lot of them, uh, especially online. I've gone back and, and seen probably over 100 of the old, uh, really cool uh, Chinese or, or Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. And I actually like those older films from decades ago better than the modern ones. The modern ones are very polished. They have special effects. You know, the cinematography is great, but they seem more formulaic. And the older ones were just great. There's a lot of quaint stories, a lot of unexpected surprises, and a lot of real character development. So I really love to watch those old Kung Fu movies, even if they're in black and white, even if the... Um, the, the video is shaking because someone shot it in a movie theater with a personal <laughs> camera, you know, even with subtitles, uh, it's just great stuff. So I've really gotten, uh, into those in the last couple of years. Another, another martial arts sequence uh, or series of films that I, I remember watching is the Zatoichi series. I don't know if you know the, the Zatoichi. I don't. Okay. Well, you got to check them out. He, um, he's a blind swordsman. So he's like, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, they call him Satoichi the Blind Swordsman in English, but it's it's kind of a legend. I don't think it's necessarily based on a true story, but it's really good stuff. Those films were made, there's about 20 or 30 of those films. They were made, I think, in the 50s or 60s, and they're just incredible. And the actor who plays Zatoichi, um, I think it's Shintaro Katsu is his name, but um, he does a remarkable job, and... Uh, each each movie, each story, they're each maybe an hour and a half or so, uh, is just incredibly well done, uh, very dramatic, and very funny, too. And so there was a period of time when I, I watched the first one, and I ended up watching all 20 or 30 of those Zatoichi films in about a one-month span online. Uh, I'll never forget those. And uh, so, yeah, definitely, I love martial arts films. I could give you more and more examples, but those are just a few. Sure. And I can hear in your voice, you know, and, and, and your answers, you know, there really seems to be something that resonates for you in, in the authentic culture, you know, that kind of throwback stuff. I mean, I'm getting the sense that that's what appeals to you about sumo too, the authenticity, the cultural influence and, uh, the, the historical aspect. Yeah, definitely. That is a very good point. I have, you know, mixed feelings about traditional Japanese culture, because there's kind of a beauty to it, but there's also, some people would say, maybe a rigidity to it. And I see both sides. So, for example, with, with pro sumo, um, someone who joins pro sumo, like Biamba or Yama or many other guys have, it's almost like joining the military, because you don't have an off-season. You're pretty much living in the hay or living in the, you know, the, the school where you, you're, you're one of the the sumo wrestlers, full-time, year-round. And a guy like Biamba, for example, he's from Mongolia. He spent almost five years there, and I think he got to visit his family once for a few days during those five years. And so when you join pro sumo, you are working every day, seven days a week, around the clock. You wake up, you have your training, you have your meal, you have some chores, take a nap, etc. So there's a certain beauty to the discipline and the tradition of Japanese culture, and there's a lot that people can learn today from that tradition. On the other hand, you know, I think in, in my, from my perspective, there's a certain complementary side to things that needs some flexibility, it needs um, kind of a broader perspective, 
And so some people, of course, are critical on something that's exclusively based on these traditions because they would say, hey, this is, this is too rigid, this is too extreme. You know, in, in Japan, women are not even allowed to touch the, uh, the pro sumo ring where the, the guys compete. Um, so there's really two sides to it. From any tradition, there, there's um, kind of two sides to it. And I see the beauty of it, and I also see the perspective that some people have that the tradition needs to be changed. But um, I think there's validity to both of those things. But I definitely have enjoyed learning. I'm learning on a daily basis, even today, about the cultural aspects of sumo and Japanese culture. So as you move forward, as you you know, continue to, to dedicate yourself to sumo professionally and personally and, and work crazy hours. And, you know, we were just talking offline about a, a, a lengthy and, and overseas trip that you had, you know, quite a few hours to prepare for. You know, there's got to be something that's keeping you going there. Are there goals that you're working towards? Yeah, that's a great question about goals. So, like I said, at the very beginning, there was no particular goal. It was simply, hey, let's do this event. Hey, let's do this. Let's you know participate in this film project. And um, there is a little more clarity now. And um, one of the aspects is to share authentic sumo because just like with any martial arts, uh, there's a lot of uh, people out there who want to uh, show their knowledge, and there's a lot of good people out there, but. I think one of the fundamentals for me is to make sure we have guys like Yamba, Yama, Takeshi, and others who have lived and trained sumo for many, many years in Japan and who can genuinely show people what it's about. And so I'm not personally going to pretend that I have the ability that they have, but I just want to be there to help facilitate sharing their knowledge. And um, I can do that, you know, interpreting for them, um, I can work closely with, with Americans who are learning sumo. So that, that's one important point, to keep the real fundamentals, the genuineness of the sumo tradition um, going here, even, even though it's not a professional sport here, it's on an amateur level. But I think uh, in the coming years, we're going to see an increase in people who are taking sumo seriously in this country. And one of the goals, this is not a business goal at all, this is simply... Um, a personal goal that I'd like to see. I'd like to see American athletes do much better at the world champion level. Now, there's, there's kind of two different directions here. One is if someone were young, a teenager, and they wanted to enter pro sumo in Japan, they could probably do that. But if you're in your 20s, certainly beyond your early 20s, you would never be allowed into pro sumo in Japan. So if there were someone out there at a very young age who wanted to be a pro sumo wrestler and they were willing to spend years and years there with almost no break, that's one admirable goal. And there have been a few people from this country who've done that, mainly Hawaiians. But aside from that, if someone is getting into sumo a little bit later, in their, their 20s or 30s, and they don't have the opportunity to join pro sumo, they can still compete internationally and so one of my goals would be to really develop some great American sumo competitors who do well on the international level. And in about 25 years of world championship or world games events that sumo has uh, been a part of, there have only been, I think, four Americans who've gotten medals in those events, and there have probably been, gosh, a thousand plus medals awarded in all the different weight and gender classes, team competitions, etc. So we're talking about America, which is a, a powerhouse in sports and, and at least some martial arts, uh, getting four medals out of probably, like I said, over a thousand medals total, maybe even a couple thousand medals total at the world championship or world games or world combat games level. So there's a huge potential for Americans to do well in sumo, but uh, we don't have... Um, really established groups um, long-term. There's little pockets here and there. So it would be great if we could get a really core group of people who could train together. Geographic issues are also a challenge. But especially guys who could train seriously with the people I mentioned, with Biamba, with Yama, with Takeshi. And within a year or two, I think we could get a very strong team 
And we don't need people who are necessarily really large because there's lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight. Uh, if we just got really good athletes who are really dedicated, we can develop a very strong program in this country. So that, that is one of the goals I have, and that has nothing to do with business. That's just kind of a personal uh, goal that, that I would want to strive for. Uh, maybe 20-plus years ago, I would have wanted to, to be there, but uh, you know, at, at the age I am now, I'm probably not going to be competing much more on, a, on an international level. Um, and, you know, actually in recent years, almost every year I get first or second place. I'm in the top two normally in the lightweight division in this country. But uh, that should be something that uh, inspires people who are, you know, younger and, and very athletic to say, hey, how come we still have these old guys dominating? We need to get some good new young blood in the sport who can do even better and surpass what uh, people have done uh, here in, in recent years. So I, I'm hoping we get some people who are inspired to try sumo. And, and a lot of crossover martial artists do very well in sumo. There's guys who are from a judo background, from an MMA background, wrestling, football, you name it, who have fundamental athleticism and some technique, and they have great potential to, uh, to excel in sumo. That's awesome. Now, we've heard a little bit about the U.S. Sumo Open and some of the other things that you've got going on around that, but we kind of call this commercial time. So if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to learn more about what it is this competition is and sumo in, in this country in general, you know, whatever you want to share along those lines, let's hear it. Oh, well, thanks. So, you know, uh, first of all, you can go to usasumo.com and that's the site that I've developed for the last couple decades to get an idea of events that are going on, both events you could participate in as well as exhibitions that people can watch throughout the country. Now I'm based in Los Angeles it would be great if you were close by and you can train with us here. But if not, like I said, there are a few pockets of, of sumo enthusiasts here and there throughout the country. So um, we can definitely refer people to other places to train closer to them. And, uh, you know, another thing I'd encourage people to do is to check out the next U.S. Sumo Open, the 17th annual U.S. Sumo Open on June 17th this year, 2017. Uh, so June 17th in the Los Angeles area. And we get about 5,000 audience members. So if you're ready to compete and you want to spend the next few months training and getting ready, great. Or if you just want to come out and watch it as a fan, that would also be wonderful. But that is by far the, the largest tournament. Um, so I think for starters, uh, check out those things and, and feel free to email info at usasumo.com and we can provide more information, including how to become a, a member of the National Federation which is relatively simple, and it would allow anyone who's a member to compete in any tournaments throughout the country on an annual basis. Wow, awesome stuff. And, of course, again, we're going to link all that over on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Let's wrap it up yeah. the way we – oh, please. Oh, sure. I was going to mention one other thing. Um, in addition to competition, you know, there are a lot of people out there who might not want to compete at the highest level. They, they may not have aspirations – uh, to be the U.S. champion. Um, but I'll, I'll just say that for people who've never tried sumo, it's simply a great workout. So there, there have been people who come and they, they participate in practices just for the fitness aspect because you get a tremendous amount of calisthenics. In fact, the first large part of the practice is stretching, doing flexibility drills, um, and also doing the, the skull or leg lifts. So you're doing a lot of flexibility you're doing a little bit of cardio, you're doing some strength training, and doing even a few matches trains every muscle in the body. So I would say that even if you're not going to be competing, sumo is a great workout, and I encourage people from any other discipline to try it even a few times, and you, you may learn a lot and you may want to uh, continue with it further. Fantastic. We always end on the highest of possible notes. For all the people that are out there listening, what would you tell them? <laughs> well, it's hard to give a, a generic uh, piece of advice, but I think you alluded to it earlier, uh, Jeremy, and that is um, regardless of what kind of training you do, whether it's martial arts or any other kind of training in life, to, to achieve something significant, uh, as you mentioned, really requires dedication and perseverance. 
everyone's going to have ups and downs. Everyone's going to have setbacks. Um, and so I think one of the more important things that people should understand is to keep that steadiness. And, uh, you know, to me, whatever you're doing, whether it's, again, a martial arts practice or some other kind of training or some other kind of self-cultivation, doing even a few minutes a day every day uh, would be beneficial. So, you know, some people do exercise or, or some other kind of practice once a week for two hours, but I, I think it would be prudent to, to do even a few minutes every day uh, to improve yourself. And um, I think that holds true to, you know, for almost any discipline. And uh, I, I really hope that, uh, that we can continue with that in sumo. And uh, anybody listening, I, I hope you can also take that to heart with whatever practices you're doing in your life. Mr. Freund was a lot of fun to talk to, and I feel like I have a much better understanding of sumo than I did before. I'm going to try to make it to LA in June for the 2017 U.S. Sumo Open. Everything I learned about the event while putting together this episode just makes it seem so impressive and a, and a lot of fun. Maybe I'll see some of you there. Thank you, Mr. Freund, for coming on the show. Over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with a ton of links and photos. That great sumo slam we discussed is over there as well as a photo of Mr. Freund in a match with Manny Yarbrough. If you enjoyed the episode, you don't want to miss today's show notes. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. And if you're up to help us out, giving something back, you can share the show. You can leave us a review. You can join the newsletter list, join the Facebook group, like Whistlekick on Facebook, or make a purchase. We appreciate all of the help that you continue to show us as the show grows and as Whistlekick grows. So personally, thank you. Remember, we want your guest suggestions too. So help us out. There's another way you can help us, right? Make some introductions to some of the great martial artists in your life, and let's continue to add diversity to this show. We can learn a lot from each other, regardless of our style, or age, location, or anything else like that. Thank you for listening. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.